Thank you. And without further ado, Rabbi Silber. Thank you. So the first text actually is not from the Tanakh. I mean, it is from the Tanakh, but it's a collection of verses. And that is the little prayer, Yehi Chavod Hashem Liolam. Yehi Chavod Hashem Liolam, which is found in the earliest sitter that we have, which is the sitter of Amram Gon of the 8th century. And clearly it's earlier than that, obviously. Um, is a collection of verses. Most of what we call Psuke de Zimra, the core of Psuke de Zimra, as I mentioned a couple of times, and the Gemara in Shabbat on page 118, Kufiud Chet, says this according to most interpreters, are the last six Psalms of the Book of Psalms, beginning with what we call Ashrei, which hopefully we'll get to later uh, this evening. Though that is the core of Psuke de Zimra, there's a blessing before and a blessing after. The blessing before is called Baruch She'amar. The blessing after is Yishtabach. And the core, the heart of Pesuket de Zimra are the last six Psalms. And of those six Psalms, the most significant one clearly is what we call Ashrei, which actually doesn't begin with the word Ashrei. If we get there later, we'll discuss that. Otherwise, next week, it begins with the word Tiyu David. But prior to that, there is our collection of verses. When you have a collection of verses, it's always very interesting because obviously the, the collectors of those verses had something very specific in mind. There were many verses. And almost all the verses come from Tehillim. There are two that do not, which is very striking. But I wanted, uh, I know, I think we began this last week, but I had a few more observations about Yehi Chavod. Um, for those who pray every morning, uh, Yehi Chavod is recited, and I'm without... Uh, without saying anything negative, I would say, I, I assume that for many people who are actually praying everything that's written in the prayer book, uh, we read this very quickly and we don't necessarily give it a tremendous amount of thought um, about exactly which verses have been chosen and why. So I think this is an opportunity to sort of reflect on this particular set of verses. Yehi chavod Hashem riolam, so it begins by saying, may God's glory uh, be, uh, be forever, and may God rejoice in God's creations, his machashem b'masa. That's the first verse, that's the introduction. Then what is striking, that's from Psalms. Then what is striking is that the next three verses, beginning with the he shem Hashem mevorach me'atav yadolam, verse number one, God's name is blessed forever, from uh, the rising to the setting of the sun, means every place where the sun rises and sets means everywhere. God's name is to be praised. God is exalted above all nations and God's majesty is upon the heavens. Those three verses probably sound familiar to many of us, because those three verses are the very beginning of what we call Hawel, which begins in Psalm 113. These verses are exactly the verses that we say and are found in Psalm 113, which we call Hawel. Now that is very striking because we remember what the Gemara said in Shabbat, Dav Kuf Yud Chet, Rabbi Yochanan's statement, would that my portion be with those who say halo every day? And the Gemara asked the question, what are you talking about? We have a different statement. That is, whoever says halo every day, is blaspheming the name of God, it's blasphemy. How do you square those two statements? To which the Gemara gives the answer that, that Rabbi Yochan is talking about Psuke de Zimra. To say psuche de zimra every day, which Rabbi Yochanan called Hawel, that's a good thing. To say Hawel, what we call Hawel, which is Psalms 113 to 118 inclusive, that's a bad thing. Now the difference, the Gemara doesn't spell out what the difference is, but presumably the difference is that one of them deals with miracles, called Hawel HaMitzri, that's bad. To focus on miracles, that the God is a God of miracles that God's presence can be recognized always through miracles, that's blasphemy. But, the, but, but these six Psalms, not the last six Psalms, uh, not the Psalms of 113 to 118 inclusive, but the Psalms of 145 to 150 inclusive, 
because Psuke de Zimra is also six psalms. But these six psalms are different than presumably because they don't speak about miracles. They speak about God's daily and constant interaction with the world. So that's already a good thing. That's a wonderful thing. But it is interesting that the Gemara seems to call Psuke de Zimra Havel. It calls it Havel. It uses that same word, Havel. So that's very striking. And we'll come back to this later. But this is how we begin Yehichavot, which is the introduction to Ashrei. One might say the introduction to the prayer service. Yehichavot. Those are the first verses. The next verse is also interesting. Hashem shimcha liyoram, Hashem zichmecha ledar vadar. The next verse says, Hashem, yud hei this name of God, that is your name. Hashem zichmecha, this is how you are recalled or, or spoken of or remembered in every generation. Now this verse, seems like a kind of innocuous verse, but actually when you read this verse, there's another verse which is virtually identical to the extent that you wonder if the psalmist uh, actually had the other verse in mind. Hashem shimcha liolam, Hashem zichvecha ledar vadar recalls a different verse, one that is quite significant in the biblical narrative, and one of the more significant stories of the biblical narrative. And the story, of course, is the story of Moshe at the snap. God's calling of Moshe, God's first calling of Moshe, the burning bush, and God is instructing Moshe to carry out the mission upon which God sends him, go back to Egypt and to deliver the people and to redeem the people. Um, that is the mission. And Moshe, as we recall in chapter three and four of the book of Exodus, resists, resists God's command. There's different, a variety of excuses, why he's not the right guy to go. And he has a lot of questions. And one of the questions he asked God is, if I go down to Egypt, the people are gonna have a question for me. What are they gonna ask me? What is your name? What should I tell them if they ask me the name of the God who sent me? To which God gives a very interesting answer. It's not a one word answer. God's answer, if you recall, let me actually find that verse in the book of Exodus. That's in chapter, where is that? That's chapter, uh, chapter three. Verses number, uh, if I can read this, let's see, verses number 14 and 15. By Yomer Elohim el Moshe, Eheyeh asher Eheyeh. So God's answer is, I am that I am. I am, I will be that which I will be. And God repeats and says, tell them, so whatever means, it's a question what means. I am that I am, it's also typically translated. Um, that's the first answer. But then God has a second answer. Vayomer od Elohim no Moshe. God gave a second answer. This Elohim gives a second answer. Kotomaro b'nei Yisrael. Say this to Israel. Hashem Elohei avotechem, the God of your ancestors, of your forefathers. Elohei Abraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov, Shlachan Yavechem. Tell them the God of the ancestors, namely, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent you. Zeshmi liolam. That is my name forever. The zezichri ledar vadar. And the dar dar. And this is my, the way I shall be uh, called for all eternity. Zeshmi liolam. The zezichri ledar dar. Which the psalmist takes virtually word for word. Hashem shimcha liolam. Hashem zichrecha ledar vadar. And actually, after we say the verses from Hallel, we're making the statement, we're about to say Hallel, the daily Hallel, the Hallel of the God within, within the world, the, the, God of, of, the God of daily living. And then the next verse is, to what God are we referring? To whom do we pray? 
which God are we praying to? What it means is, what do you mean the name of God? What does that mean, the name? The name of God means the way God represents God within this world. By the way, it's a very striking. I, I tell you why I like this particular class a lot. It's because there are things that many people say all the time. I'll include myself in this. And typically pay very little attention to what we're saying. And the sitter is actually a gold mine. That's the truth of it. What is very striking about the Siddur is, if you think about it, the tremendous emphasis from beginning to end, not upon God so much, it is upon God, but upon God's name. Even the blessings on Psuki de Zimra, right? Yachid uh, Baruch Shalmar, Yachid Olamim, Melech Meshubach Mufara, Adei Ad Shimo Hagadol. His name is very great. Bless, and, and then Yishtabach at the end. Yishtabach Shimcha Ad Malkeinu. Your name, God, shall be praised. And throughout the entire Siddur, the tremendous focus on God's name. When Moshe was asking it, what manifestation of God are we talking about? And in fact, the word shame is one of those words that is so central to the biblical narrative. And the word shame often is refers to, to, to God's presence in terms of God's temple. The, the, the sacred space, the temple, the mikdash, is hamokoma sheyivchar Hashem, Rosum et Shemosham, the place that God chooses to put God's name there. Now, later on, hopefully, we will deal with the question, what is the name that's, that, that, that's within the temple? Within the sacred space, there's a name, but God has many names. So what's interesting is that in the Torah, when Moshe said, what God should I speak of? And he could ask me, which God sent you? The first answer is Eiyah. Eiyah is either an answer, or A, it could also be seen as a non-answer. I am what I am. Don't ask me what I am. Whatever I am, I am. That's one way to read it. But here's what you should say to them. Here's the important thing to say to them. The God of their ancestors. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's my name. That's the way I should be called. And actually, of course, when you think about it, in our prayer service, the core prayer, of course, we pray it's called the Amido of the Shemona Esra, and it begins. Elokeinu v'elokei avoteinu, Elohei Avraham, Elohei Yitzchak, Elohei Yaakov. Some of the liberal synagogues added the Imahot as well. And I'll discuss that actually in the future. Uh, I'm, very, I'm very sympathetic to that, to that viewpoint, but there is a reason that it's the Avot, actually. There was a reason for that. But we'll get there someday, I hope, um, one step at a time. But here you have it in the very beginning of Yehi Chavod, an introduction to Ashrei, which itself is the introduction to the prayer service. And the name of God is the name of the eternal one, Hashem, yud Hey vav Hey. That's the name that should be recalled, <clears throat> and specifically when it comes to prayer. And I'm reminded, actually, <clears throat> in this context <clears throat> of the Ramban. You know, the Torah says, there's a verse in the book of Exodus, the verse is, Zoveach le'ohim yocharam, bilti Hashem rivado. He who sacrifices le'ohim should be excommunicated or excised. Only Hashem. Sacrifice only Hashem. So the plain meaning of the text is obviously he who sacrifices to another god. Elohim means other gods. Only bring your sacrifices to Hashem. And the Ramban understands that. But the Ramban offers a kind of a, another interpretation rooted in, in Kabbalistic thinking. So, Ve'ach le'ohim yocharam, says the, says, the Ram, says the Ramban, one who brings sacrifices le'ohim to the God who manifests as Elohim, that's out, that's out of the question. Bilti Hashem levado. Sacrifices are brought only to this particular manifestation of God the God of Yudhei Vavei, the God of eternity, the God of past, present, and future. That's the God to whom we, whom we bring sacrifices. And the Ramban plays with this theme because the Ramban is bothered by something else, namely, what about Yom Kippur? What about the scapegoat sacrifices? Soyer Echad Vashem, the Soyer Echad Lazazel. So the Ramban deals with that. What does it mean, Soyer Lazazel, the scapegoat? So it's the, the bribe to, the, the to Samoyel. 
paying the devil his due. But the point is the Ramban makes the point that the one to whom we sacrifice, and since prayer essentially is called avodah shabalev, we can extrapolate from that, that, and it's interesting, that the prayers, typically the prayers are Hashem. Baruch Hashem is the typical standard blessing. Baruch Hashem. In the Amid we had the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So that's the God. So here, the verse over here in Psalms, given this approach, the approach that I put forth, which is the approach of the intertext, when you read this verse in Psalms, there is no way you're not thinking of the verse in the, in the, in, in the Torah. It's, it's, it's actually word for word. So you're remembering, you're asking the question as we begin the, what manifestation of God, what name of God? And it's very interesting that actually, I would have thought there's a different name of God. If it were up to me to decide where the daily Amida should be to, to the God to whom we pray, I would have chosen a different name. Because after all, and we'll, we'll get to these things later, coming attractions, but I would have given a different name. Because after all, if you think about our, our, our tefillah, which is the silent prayer, our silent prayer connects us to one particular person and only one. The rabbis have chosen this person upon which to, to, to model prayer, silent prayer. And of course that is Hannah, the mother of all prayers. It's a silent prayer. And it's when you, you, you say either in the temple or facing the temple. It's exactly Hannah's prayer. The God to whom Chana prays is not Hashem, is Hashem, but it's Hashem Tzvaot. That's where the term Hashem Tzvaot first appears in the Bible, in that chapter. It appears in the Bible 277 times or something like that, but never appears until the story of Chana. But Tomer Hashem Tzvaot. And what is even more surprising when you think about the sitter, that the blessing that leads you to the Amida, and the Talmud speaks about to make the blessing on redemption before we pray. The blessing is Ga'al Yisrael. And what is the, what is the text of the blessing? So Yisrael, and then the Ashkenazim say, Kuma be Ezrat Yisrael. The Sephardim don't say that, but they do say, Go'aleinu Hashem Tzvaot Shmo. The name of our Redeemer is Hashem Tzvaot, the Holy One of Israel. Baruch Ato Hashem Ga'al Yisrael, and then the Amidah. One would have expected that the Amida rooted in Hannah's prayer, and she prays to Hashem Tzvaot, and you mention Hashem Tzvaot at the very end of the blessing. Go aleinu Hashem Tzvaot, our Redeemer is Hashem Tzvaot. We would have expected, obviously, Baruch Atah, Hashem Tzvaot, Elokeinu, whatever. No. Tzvaot is not mentioned in the standard Amida, but, and I want to give everything away, but it does appear elsewhere within the service in an interesting way. Stay tuned, we'll get there someday, hopefully. In any event, the God to whom we pray, and there's something else interesting about the God to whom we pray. Because after all, the name is yud heh vav -Hey, right? Probably related to a in some sense, but it's Hashem. I am, I, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Ten Commandments, right? God said to Abraham, I, I'm the God who took you out of work, Hashem. Anochi Hashem. However, we don't read it the way it's written. We read it differently. We pronounce it with the with the with the with the Adonai. We say we don't say it. We don't say Shem Hashem. So actually, it's an interesting question. The name of the God that we we invoke in our prayers. To which what dimension of God are we primarily focusing on? What is the primary? Is it the God who is the Adon? The master, or is it the God of is, or is it is it Hashem? Because after all, you read it one way, but it's written a different way. To which do we give primacy? These are very important questions, and we will deal with these questions later on when we get to Shema and the uh, and, and the Amida. But in any event, my point about the Hichavod is that this choice of verses, and it's a choice of verses, that they chose these particular verses, one might say to prepare us for prayer and to prepare us for Psuke de Zimra, which is Hallel. So the first verse is a Hallel, three verses from Hallel. And then, to whom we pray, Hashem. This Hashem, this Hashem is Shmi Yolam, and this is Zichri Lidar Vadar.
And now we come to something else interesting about the choice of verses from Psalms. And that is the next three verses. Hashem b'ashamayim heichim kiso u'malchuto b'akol mashava yismuchu ashamayim b'tagel ha'aretz v'yomru v'agoyim Hashem molach Hashem melech Hashem molach Hashem yimroch Hashem molach Hashem yimroch v'yoram v'ed So I believe last week I may be misremembering but I think last week I spoke a bit about these verses. So first of all I wanted to say that the focus of all three verses, and this appears throughout our prayer service, is about God's kingship. Melech muhulalu mishabach. That's how we start the blessing of Psuke de Zimra. It's about kingship. God is king, right? And typically, our, our, our blessings typically do contain the word melech, melech halalam. And even in the Amida, which is the exception to the rule, and it doesn't mention malchut in the beginning, but it does mention Melech either two or three times in the first three blessings, depending on your precise text. But the idea of God as king is central to the whole sitter. And here we have it. And in particular, what is striking, and this is the point I want to make, the, uh, the, the point about reading, about reading the text. Hashem Melech, Hashem Malach, Hashem Yimloch, V'yoram Va'ed is exceptional. What is exceptional about it? Did I mention this last week? No. So you're in for a nice surprise. Let me ask you a question. The, the verses are all from Tehillim. They're from Psalms. Almost every one of them. As we say in the blessing of Baruch Shamar, We say that. We're going to praise you with the songs of, 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 songs of David. Shira in, in biblical Hebrew, in, in our language, in English, we have the word for song and we have poetry. But in biblical Hebrew, the word shir means both poem and also song. They probably sang the poems. I have no doubt they sang the poems. Um, so what's interesting is, where is this verse from? Hashem melech, Hashem molach, Hashem yimloch, v'yolam ha'ed. Where is that verse from? Can anybody tell me where that verse is from? I'm not, a betting, I'm not a betting man, but I would bet that nobody knows. That's my bet. Nobody knows. You tell me. Shira. Huh? Where is it from? It is Hashem Yimloch Yolam Va'ed is from Az Yashira. That is true. But I'm saying Hashem Melech, Hashem Molach, Hashem Yimloch Yolam Va'ed. Though that, that pasuk, which it's appears, right. for example, in the davening of Rosh Hashanah, and some of the piyuti, right? Etc. Where is the verse from? Answer. There is no such verse. It doesn't exist. It's the only part of it's made up. There is no Hashem Melech is found in many places. Hashem Malach is found. Hashem Yimloch Yulam Ved is a verse. But there is actually no verse of Hashem Melach, Hashem Malach, Hashem Yimloch Yulam Ved. Now the question is, what do we make of the fact that it's not a verse? It, the, the rabbis constructed, whoever wrote the Siddur, they constructed a verse, which is very unusual. And I'll tell you what I make of it. When you have something which is completely not fitting in, with, with, with what is the norm, then we underline that several times with red ink and say, this is something very significant. They're going out of their way to make a point that this idea that God is, was king, is king, and will be king, Hashem Yimloch Yolam Ra'ed, strikes us as something which is absolutely essential to the, to the, to the sitter. And actually, when you think about it, um, and we'll get to this later on, but you have this, this idea. The place where it comes up in the most obvious place is, of course, the Shema. Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, which some interpret to mean, understand Israel. God, our God, who's one, is in fact one. That is to say, we are accepting this one God, 
and we believe, or we hope, that someday the world will come to the same understanding. And you have this actually, we'll get to this later on, in the end of Sukkot and Zimran, Shibat Hayam, with some add of the, the statement of the Torah Tcha, Katuv Leymar, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. Right after the verse, Hashem Yimroch Yolam Ba'ed, and in the Torah it says, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. So the idea then of prayer, central motif of the sinner, is that God is king, and that we accept God's kingship, God runs the world. God has makes demands of the world in the way we should behave. Those demands issue from God's palace. The king is in the palace. The palace we call the, 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 the mikdash, the temple. God issues commands, makes demands. That's how God runs the world. Someday we hope, we aspire to a world in which God's commands of acting in a moral and a honest way will be adhered to by the whole world. So. Interesting, by the way, in this sense, I'll just for one small digression, and that is on the day of, there's a day in the year in which God's kingship becomes front and center. That's the basic theme of the day, and that's Rosh Hashanah. Malchiot Sichrod, and the Malchiot service consists of verses from the Bible about God's kingship, 10 verses, three from the Torah, three from the Psalms, three from the prophetic writings, and a tenth verse from the Torah. The tenth verse from the Torah on Rosh Hashanah is always found, always, in two of the three in intermediate blessings of Rosh Hashanah. The tenth biblical verse from the Torah is found in the middle of some kind of request. For example, remembrances. God, God is remembering Zichronov, nine verses, and then, Oh, we beseech God, remember us for good. In the middle of that paragraph is the 10th verse from the Torah. The same thing is true of the shofar, which in the, the davening of Rosh Hashanah means revelation, God's presence. After we have nine verses, it's the great shofar of redemption, sound the shofar of redemption. And in that paragraph, in that request, there's the 10th verse. But when it comes to Malchiot, to God's kingship, there are nine verses. And then the 10th verse, and the 10th verse of Malchiot is nothing other than Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. God is one, singular. Whatever Echad means, good question. Let's say singular, different, other. And then, Oh God, reign over the reign over the whole world. And there, the Shema precedes the request. When it comes to the other two, the the request precedes the tenth verse. But when it comes to Malchiot, the Shema, the statement, the tenth verse precedes the request. And the reason for that, I think, is actually simple, which is. The request is God should reign over all of God's creation. It's inappropriate for me to say God should reign over God's creation until I first accept God personally. Then you can say, okay, I accept God. I'm, I'm beholden to God. I'm committed to following God's path. And I pray that others will follow what, what I do. But it would be very inappropriate to pray for the next guy when I'm not doing it myself. So therefore, the Shema then, pre the Shema is part of the request, but it, it's a necessary prerequisite. That Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem, it's exactly what I said. Namely, we accept, and we hope after we accept, that others will follow, since we believe it's the right thing, we hope that others will accept God and God's demands and God's commandments, etc. So this is the idea of Hashem Melech, Hashem Yimrochi Yolam Ba'ed, it's taken, to be a, 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 a prayer, a hope, an aspiration that someday it will be, others will come to recognize their responsibilities, the demands upon all of us, the way people should behave, et cetera. That's the, that's the prayer, that's the aspiration. So that's at the center of Yehi Chavod, actually. So the, the, the Hallel, then the name of God, and then God's kingship, and they to underscore the importance, it's so central, 
that they made up a verse. Verse doesn't exist. There is no such verse, actually. That's always a tip off when they made up the verse that it's something very special. And we give one more example of that within Yehi Chavod, where there's an exception to the rule. Exceptions to the rule are things we always look for. And in fact, in, when we study the Torah in general, the Bible in general, and the Bible consists of parallel texts, intertexts, one text recalls the other in language and motif. And we're always looking for, for, for that which doesn't fit, that which breaks the pattern. That which breaks the pattern is calling attention to itself is highly significant. There's something else in this Yehi that is an exception. I don't expect anybody to realize this. I myself did not realize it until very recently when I began to look at the sitter. Sounds crazy, I know, but anyway. And now we move to the next theme, which is Hashem Elcholam Vaed of Duka Yimei Atzo. God is the king forever. God is supreme. God is knowing the thoughts. Atzat Goyim, Heini Machshivot Amin, rebuffing or canceling out the thoughts of the other of the nations of the world. Now we have the next verse. Rabot machshavot bulevish. Human beings have many machshavot, many thoughts, many ideas, many thoughts. Atzat Hashem hitakum. But God's, God's thinking, literally advice, God's thinking, God's counsel, is one that is permanent, one that will stand. That's an interesting verse. Rabot machshavot bulevish. You read that verse, you jump out of your seat. Why? No one's jumping, I see. What is it about that verse that makes you jump out of your seat? What's man doing in there? No, 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 no. There's something much more simple. Don't we have, don't we have freedom of choice? You, 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 I'm misleading you. <laughs> you're, thinking, you're thinking too. You're thinking too much, much too deeply. You're too profound. There's a different problem here. It's a very simple problem. Rabot machshavot bulevish v'atzat Hashem itakum is not a verse from Psalms. It's a verse from Proverbs. It's a verse from Mishlei. A completely exception to the rule. Every verse in Tzuket Zimra, every central verse. And every verse in the Hichabod, with the exception of Hashem Yimoch Yovam Ba'ed, and the other, it's not a verse altogether, is from Tehillim. In fact, almost everything in Psuke Zimra is from Tehillim, including Hodu, which is from Divrei Hayamim, but it's David's song. The assorted verses at the end of Hodu, Miz Moshir Chanukat Abayi, the Psalm the David, Psalm number 30. The six Psalms at the end are all ascribed to David. Every verse in the Yichavod, with, with that exception of Hashem Nimroch, it's all King David. It's all David's songs. It's David's poetry. But Rabot Machshavot Bulevish is not David. Rabot Machshavot Bulevish is actually from Mishle, which is ascribed not to David, but to Solomon. That is surprising to put. Of course, you have to notice it. And once you notice that, you say, wow. I mean, they imported the verse, which doesn't belong here. It means they felt it's so central and so important that we have to include it. And Rabot Machshavot Bulevish Vatzat Hashem Itakum. They want us to be thinking about this as we pray. Vatzat Hashem Itakum. And I'm reminded, there are many ways to see this. I'm reminded of something that, uh, that uh, Heschel taught, actually. Heschel taught a lot about prayer. And he, had, he made the following observation or the following description of an aspect of prayer that he felt was central. Um, and that is the way he saw prayer was, I would call it uh, multiple perspectives. That when I am praying, I'm, I'm thinking about what I, what I, what I need what I need to function properly in the world, uh, where, wherever I stand, what I see is necessary for me to move forward. Not so much what I want, but what I need. And Heschel's point is, that is central to prayer. That's one dimension. 
I, I just, the, it's the world as I see it. And then the challenge of prayer is at the same time that I'm describing the world as I see it, I want to try to figure out the world as, as God sees it. The world as God sees it. That's what Heschel put out there. That at the very same time, we're doing both. It's the world as I see it. And then there's the world as God sees it. Perhaps it's related to the, 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 the Kabbalistic idea of the two of the spheral, one being Malchut and one being Teferit. Malchut being the world as it is, and Teferit being the world as the world might be, the world could be, the world maybe should be. Uh, I'm not sure that Heschel was, is precisely the same as that, but the idea of entering into prayer with more than one perspective, trying to imagine the way God sees the world. Um, and that perhaps is uh, suggested by exactly this verse. In other words, yes, we have many thoughts, we have many uh, opinions, we have many perceptions, but there's another way to see the world, which is important to recognize that they're two different, and to try to see it from someone else's perspective. I would say that generally speaking, and I would put this in terms of prayer, this is another interesting idea I think we'll get to later on. I believe it is suggested by prayer that what prayer is does, among other things, if we adopt Heschel's point of view, to try to see the world, not just from God's perspective, but to try to see the world from someone else's perspective, to recognize there's another way to see the world. I see it a certain way. Maybe, maybe my friend, my neighbor, or even not my non-friend, may see the world from a different perspective and to be able to recognize how others might see it differently without abandoning my own, my own beliefs. I'm not suggesting that we, anything goes, never suggesting that. We have our way of seeing it based on, based on what we see, you know, based on, based on the evidence. You know, nowadays they talk about, I believe in science. That is utter nonsense, utter and complete nonsense to believe in no such thing. I believe in science in the sense that what science says is you, that you go with the data. You make decisions based on the best information that you have. And sometimes scientists decide we had a very good hypothesis, it made total sense, and now we have different data, now we see it differently, and we change it. That's science. No such thing as believing in science. That's nuts. Believing in, you go with the data. You don't make up the data, you see what it says, and you follow the data. And the scientific inquiry is always searching for, 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 for the truth, never gives up the search for truth. But the truth is the truth of the moment, the truth that we recognize right now, this is what appears to be right. So the idea of being able to believe in something, yes, but the recognition that you can never be 100% certain. There's always, we're always open to other possibilities. And from that perspective, I would say that prayer has the advantage if we adopt, I would say, Rabbi Heschel's point of view. Um, it opens us to the possibility that not just God has a way to see the world, but maybe others have seen the world differently. And we should think about that. There is another way to see it without being wishy-washy and saying, we don't have any, no, you have your firm beliefs, but firm beliefs doesn't mean that you know 100% for sure because we can never know 100% for sure. That's, that is what's sure, we can never know for certain. So therefore, and I would say more generally, what's interesting is that, and we'll come to this later, that when we get to the Amida, the idea that the way we talk in prayer can be a model for the way we talk generally, which I think is suggested by the way we end the Amida. There's a little prayer at the end of the Amida it's a very beautiful prayer, actually. Um, and it's uh, Chaim Kranz's favorite prayer, right, Chaim? <laughs> you once said that. It's your favorite. And what that actually is saying is the following. In prayer, the idea of standing in prayer is, I can actually be honest. I'm standing before God. I'm not going to fool God. I may fool other people. I may fool myself but I can't fool God. And therefore I'm gonna talk honestly because God knows everything. 
So it's no, you can't hide anything. And therefore, I'm going to speak for these few moments. I'll talk honestly. What I really think, what I really believe, how I really feel. And then we, after we finish the Amit, we say, would that I would always be able to speak this way. Would that I would always tell the truth. I would not malign the other, right? Would that I would be able to hear the criticisms. That, that's what we say. That's the Kailut So it's seeing the, this activity of prayer, which is at the end of the day speech, as a model for the way we speak more, more generally. Anyway, just to summarize what we have in this Lui, uh, Hashem the first point being that because it's a collection of verses, we ask ourselves the question, why these verses? They didn't simply say, read Psalm 30. We can ask the question why they chose Psalm 30. We discussed that. But here it's even more so, because here they're collecting verses, even making up one verse. And then because it's a, 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 a human construction in the sense they're choosing, why did they choose these particular things for this little prayer of Yichavod as an introduction to Pesuket and Zimra, as an introduction to prayer in general? And what is being highlighted over here? And the point I want to make is that some of these verses suggest something very, very central about prayer. I'll mention one more thing, then I'll stop for comments and questions, and then we'll finish, um, finish up for this evening. Um, the last verse is interesting. The last verse of Yichvod, Hashem Hoshia HaMelech Yaneinu B'Yom Koreinu, which is the last verse, is a verse actually from Psalms, and it's the 20th Psalm. It's a Psalm that is recited typically after the Amida. It's a Psalm that I saw in some of the old, I believe in the, and I don't, I never actually prayed there in the morning. But I saw in the Spanish and Portuguese uh, sitter that it appeared as a, 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 a maybe there or maybe it was in one is a Sadio or an Amram Don sitter the old sidurim that it appeared actually before Baruch Shemar, which is Psalm twenty. Yancha Hashem biyom tzara. The last verse is Hashem Hoshia Hamelech Yanenu biyom kareilu. Yancha Hashem biyom tzara. May God answer you in a time of distress. Yancha Hashem beyond Sarah. So the commentaries on the sitter point out that Yancha Hashem beyond Sarah is actually listed as the 20th Psalm. It's not clear if it's the 20th Psalm or the 19th Psalm because it's very unclear how many Psalms there are. And I'll, I'll get to this either later tonight or next week. It's not clear within, within the rabbinic tradition, it's not clear. For example, whether Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 is one Psalm or, or two Psalms. The Gemara says in one place it's one Psalm, and I'll get there. But in any event, after we have prayed the 19 or 18 or 19 blessings of the Amida, we say afterwards, Yan Cha Shem Biyom Sarah. God should answer us in a time of distress, suggesting that prayer is coming out of a sense of distress, a sense of lacking, a sense of need. And to the extent that, and we have so many requests, and then we have Yancha Hashem Biyom Tzara, and the last verse is Hashem Hoshia Hamelech Yaneinu Biyom God Hamelech. Once again, the King should answer us when we are calling out. So the last verse of Yehi Chavod, Hashem Hoshia Hamelech Yaneinu Biyom Kareinu, is a very appropriate verse for an introduction to Psukah de Zimra and an introduction to prayer more generally. Um, here we stop at this point. And this way, so what we've done so far is just a few observations about Yichavod. And I wanted to get to Ashrei, which is the most significant psalm in terms of our prayers. But before that, let me take any comments or questions that you may have, either in the chat or speak up, unmute and speak up. Rabbi. Yes. Hi. Um, because of, um, a lot of the connections you had been making in the last couple of weeks to um, to Sefer Shmuel, when you pointed out that uh, Rabot Machshava is comes from Mishle, which we attribute to Shlomo, it made me think of um, David's desire to build the bayit for God, and God saying, "You know, I don't need a house." Right. I mean, you have that chapter seven of Second Samuel. But it's not the first time that someone made a request of God and God said, 
God does not grant a request. The most striking example, which that chapter recalls, is when Moshe prays. Moshe, Moshe who's one of the, uh, Moshe is our defense attorney. Moshe is our spokesperson. And Moshe is always praying for the people and Moshe saves us on more than one occasion. And Moshe has one little request for himself. Let me cross over to the other side. And God's answer is, Ravloch, no, you can't do that. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that later on. So yes, God has God's plan. And uh, the, I think the idea is to be, to be clued in to what God's plan is. I would say that I remember many years ago, this, this idea that God has a plan for everyone and everyone has a, has a mission in this world which is in, 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 in Hasidic thinking, which is very, very deep in, 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 in Hasidic thinking. Um, and that we don't actually know what the next person's mission is. You can't really judge the next person because you don't really know what, what that person is, what that person's role is in this world. Everybody has their own mission. And the, the trick is to try, to try to figure out what our mission is, which is not so simple. Um, and the idea of trying to, I remember many years ago, there was a fellow in Israel very interesting fellow, very devout person. And he was studying, he was teaching, he was this, he was that, and he was, uh, he was a mashkiach in one of the big yeshiva, yeshivas. At the same time, he also taught second grade, he did both actually. It's a mashkiach of the Bachrim and the yeshiva. He taught kids. And he, I said to him, what are you up to? He said, uh, I don't really know. I'm not sure what the next step is. I, I'm not sure. I said, uh, I'm waiting for God to tell me. I said, let me ask you a question. When God tells you, are you gonna hear? He thought for a second, he said, I think so. And this idea, by the way, which is not limited to the Jewish people by any stretch of the imagination, um, you have it within certain uh, evangelical circles. God speaks to them. That's how they understand it. And I pray that I will hear when God speaks to me. God will direct me to do where God wants me to be. And that's a very powerful idea. Um, you know, the idea that I go where I am sent. Uh, I mean, you have it in terms of Chabad, by the way. They, I'm not sure they see it in terms of God, maybe they see it in terms of the Rebbe. But they go where the Rebbe, the Rebbe has sent me to this place, and that's where I go. And that's where my service is, not just for a year or two. I go there for life. And leaving Rebbe out of it, but I mean, the point is, one can say the same thing about figuring out what God demands of me. It's not necessarily... I remember that uh, Devorah, when she traveled, I remember one of her travels, she met this couple. They both were academics and they had positions. They were in the States down south and they were invited to be professors someplace in, uh, in uh, Germany. And uh, she was talking to them and I said, when you, when you leave, he said, well, we have we change of plan. We're going to Washington, D.C. There's a, a crack house in Washington, D.C. That's what we're spending the next several years to help those people. Why are you going there? Because God has sent us there. Very powerful, actually. And that's the idea about, it's not what we call tikkun olam. Not to do tikkun olam. It has to do with something else. It's being God's servant, actually. It's understanding where God sends us. So the idea of prayer is seeing the world from God's perspective. That is, I think, <laughs> not, it's not simple. But that is a goal of prayer, is to try to figure out where, where I serve. And there are many ways to serve. You don't have to be in a crack house in DC. You can serve in every capacity, there's ability to serve. Every capacity, every profession. And the question is what I have been called to do, that's all. So yeah, so when David wanted to build a temple, God says, that's not my plan. You're not doing it. Moshe wants to cross to the other side. You can see it, but you can't go there because you had a mission and you have completed your mission. You brought the people to this place. Someone else will take over now. Thank you very much. And Moses is called Eved Hashem and so is David. Both of those two places, Kotamar we have deal with David and Moshe is Eved Hashem. So that's the idea of, now to figure this out is not simple. I'm not suggesting it. Yes, what else? Uh, Maureen, I see that you have your hand raised, even though I, I don't see you on camera, which is all right. But if you'd like to unmute, you're welcome to go ahead. Uh, it's really Maureen's husband <laughs> who's listening in. Uh, 
Rabbi Silber, I always thought that uh, Yehiko Hashem uh, begins from uh, in the covet of Hashem, but then the next posuk is really uh, uh, refers to ourselves that we should be such that God should take pleasure in His creation. That is, we should live up to that standard, and that this is in line with what. Uh, uh, Heschel said that it's from two perspective, but you interpreted this differently. Well, I don't. I, I, I also, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying. The person who says what you say before Heschel was uh, Yeshayahu. It's the half Torah for Parshat Bereshit. All I created was 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 Vodi, and then he says later on, Ateme Dainur Mashem. You are my witnesses. You are you, you testify to my presence in the world through your behavior. You should, so that the idea, which is a heavy burden, that whatever we do should reflect God's grandeur, it's not a simple thing. But that is what the prophet says. Shayo says that clearly, and nothing that I said suggests otherwise. I mean, I was saying something different about perspective, about how one sees the world, and that I think is. What prayer is about largely is trying to figure out um, where I stand, where my commitments lie, etc. So that's, I think, very central to prayer. And I think that is in, implied by these statements about the fact that we see one way and God may see differently. Rabot machshavot b'levish atzat Hashem in So to always recall the way God sees the world. Okay, I'll take a couple more comments or questions. There were a couple more. Yeah, okay, just to- Esther, uh, um, Esther had her hand up, so I would prefer if we could go with Esther and then- Go ahead, Neha. Esther, go ahead. yes. Hi, I, I'm not even sure what my question is here. I think what you just spoke about in reference to trying to figure out what what our mission, what it is we're supposed to do in life, and, and the people who said that Hashem speaks to me, I, I just sort of sent me thinking about the Chumash where, Hashem clearly tells Avraham, you have to go lech lechan. Hashem also clearly tells Moshe and that Nebuah was a vehicle, at least for some of them, for telling them what Hashem expects. And I guess the Torah, if it's Nebuah, is also that vehicle to all of us. I'm not sure what to do with it. You sort of introduced a whole new idea to think about. Well, I certainly hope I did. I mean, that's the point. But let me say something else. Since you mentioned uh, Abraham, and sometimes it's clear. God says, Lechucha. Okay. But let me give you an example where it's not so clear. Because it's clear that God said, and Abraham has no, Abraham doesn't think he's hearing voices. Abraham doesn't think that. Abraham, there's not a question whether God is truly speaking to Abraham or not in the biblical text. God is speaking to Abraham. That's clear. But let me give you another story, which is similar to that. Where, it's, where, where to the person, it can't be 100% clear. And that is when Abraham sends his servant to find the wife for Isaac. And the, and the servant comes with the camels and all that. He meets Rebecca at the well. And then he tells his story. He says that I was at the well and I was sent to find a, a, a wife for the son of my master, Abraham. And, and I had set up this test and Rebecca passed the test. And so there, the question is, it's not clear. I mean, it can't be 100% clear to Rivka that this is actually, they say initially, this is the word, we have, what choice do we have? God has spoken. But the, the way it's, the story is set up, it's not that Vayomer Hashem El Lavan or something like that. There's a story, there's an intermediary, there's a spokesperson, a very clever one, a negotiator. And Rivka has to figure out, is this actually God speaking or not? And she determines that it is. And she makes that choice. So these choices are often fraught. It's not that in, in real life, it doesn't work that way. In real life, it's very hard to know, really, uh, what is often the, the right decision to make. The decisions are not black and white. The decisions are fraught. And there's arguments to be made on all sides. And the question is, is there a kind of an instinct that we have to make that decision correctly. That was my question to my friends in Israel. If God speaks to you, will you hear it? And he said, he thought, he said, I, I, I think I will actually, I, I think I will. But that's not a simple matter. 
And we, off, we know we've made bad decisions in life. So therefore, it's not so simple. But I think there's a sense that maybe it's an optimistic sense about the human being that we can make these choices. Uh, if I take one or two more comments, I'll have to stop in about five minutes. Um, yeah, yeah, I want to I want to push back against your idea that um, that sense of mission or knowing one's mission from Hashem is something different than tikkun olam, because the Has Hasidic masters from front to back are full of the notion they they repeat the Arizal in this actually that that every person every moment has a mission, a distinct and unique mission. And, and, and in fact, the Slonimer in, 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 in his writings, um, Nesivus Hashem, is full from front to back of this idea that through providence, you can dope out, you can discern your mission, and you must. It's a must to do that. But I agree with you in the sense that, in the sense that Tikkun Olam has been co-opted in liberal circles to mean something different than that. Right, I wasn't, right, I'm not, by the way, don't get me wrong, I'm not against Tikkun Olam. I'm all in favor of, but my point is not about the words Tikkun Olam. My point is that Tikkun Olam is not the same thing as saying, I am God's servant and I do God's will. And by the way, when you talk, I, I use Chabad as an example. I'm not, I don't want to get into Chabad, but I simply an example because there are people there who simply feel that they are directed to go a certain place. And I can tell you that I've had some interactions with some of them and some of them are, are quite wonderful. And if you try to thank them, they look at you like you're out of your mind. What are you thanking me for? I mean, this is my job. I mean, what, what, what do you mean thank you? Everybody has their job. He say to me, David, thank you for the shear. What do you mean thank you for the shear? That's what I do. Uh, that's what I. That's how I see my mission is to teach. I mean, thank you. Don't thank me. It's, it's that's different than tikkun olam. Being an eved Hashem is is a different sense to it. Actually, not exactly. I'm not suggesting there's not a tikkun. Everything, but that's do. exactly wrong that. because tikkun olam because tikkun olam has to do with the revelation that there is only God here. With in olam in olam Kabbalistic olam. circles, that's what that's it right. means. But that's exactly the that's exactly that it's not you. Okay, fine. fine. There's no fine. me to thank. No, no, I, we, we, we actually have to agree on this point. Uh, yeah, we have no disagreement here. With take, the word is in that davening, Raleinu, with takein olam b'malchut shadai, to do God's bidding in the world. And it's not just the big things. And that's the idea of psukin, it's the little things. The little things often are more significant and say a lot more about us than, than the big things. Okay, let me just say one last word about an introduction to Ashrei, which is Clearly, the central psalm in Psuke de Zimba, and the Gemara says so. Yes. Uh, could there be one more question yes. first? Neha has been waiting very patiently. Oh, if you would ahead. like to unmute. Yes. Please. Uh, I think I did. No. Speak up. Yep. Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. Yeah. I was along all those lines of knowing what God wants in you. To me, what always speaks of you, Ratzonim Rafi, that we should be tuned into this Ratzon. And figuring out what is the Ratzon and sort of being in alignment with that, whatever that is, Ratzon. And that's kind of the goal. And it's, it's sort of, I think, intuitive. And you go into a different space of just, think, you know, sensing what you need to do. But, and it kind of comes together with, with that Ratzon. But, but the word Ratzon always puzzled me in that way because what is this Ratzon and figuring out? This right. I mean, the, uh, the idea of doing God's bidding, it, it, the difficult part is figuring it out, you know? Um, you know, that's very true. And I think that's part of prayer is to try to figure, I mean, hopefully we'll deal with that somewhere down the road. And we talk about, you know, we talk about this, this activity of prayer and how one can accomplish that actually. How can one get a better sense, because we all know that we may be, we're all experts on what the other guy is doing wrong. And we're much less expert on what we're doing wrong. We, it's easy to see mistakes in the other and to see mistakes in ourselves is, 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 is much more difficult. So uh, if prayer is about trying to get a sense of self and what we should be doing, et cetera, how can one you know, try to make that happen within the context of prayer? So when we get to the Amida, whenever that will be, 
I want. I don't want to rush to get them. The idea is I want this to be these sessions to be to to both in the fall, and then we take a little break in after Thanksgiving, and then we'll resume with different classes. Then we'll resume uh, at the end of January till hopefully to through May. And I wanted to get through the sitter, but I don't want to rush through it. So um, okay, let me say just a couple of words, and I'll stop. Uh, I discovered last week that the class ends at nine o'clock. I didn't know that. I thought we ended nine fifteen. I'll take just two minutes, and I will just say the just two minutes, an introduction to Ashley. The next uh, the next thing that we say, which is the key psalm, as the as the Talmud says explicitly, that uh, the recitation of Ashley is the critical psalm. Now we call it Ashley. The truth of the matter is that Ashley is is not Ashley. Because Psalm 145 doesn't start with the word Ashrei. Psalm 145 starts with the word Tehillah with David. Tehillah with David. Let me just say one word now and I have to pick it up next week. The book that we are reading before we pray, before the Shema, before the Amida, the book is this, all the, almost every single verse is from the book we call Tehillim. The book is called Tehillim. In fact, the Sefer Tehillim is called Sefer Tehillim. It's found in Pekei Avot, in the sixth chapter, the bright of Pekei Avot. It's found in the, in the, in the Mishnah Yot. Sometimes it's written Tehillim, sometimes it's written Tehillim. But the book is called the Book of Tehillim, which is actually very striking because in the superscripts of the Psalms, in the 150 Psalms, the word that appears more than any other word is the word Mizmar. Mizmar appears, I think, 55 times or so. Shir appears 30 some odd times. Tehillah, in the superscription of the Psalms, 150 Psalms, appears a grand total of one time. Only in Psalm 145, no other, no other Psalm. So it is interesting that we call the book, the book of Tehillim, whereas only one of the Psalms actually starts with Tehillah with David, which is Psalm 145, that we call Ashrei. So what I wanted to do next week is to look at Ashrei. Tehillah David has two verses that precede it, which are not from the Psalm, and a verse that follows it. It's not part of the Psalm. It's an import. And the first two verses are imported. So I wanted to talk briefly about that. I did want next week to briefly talk about the Book of Psalms, just the structure of the book, how the book of Psalms is actually, actually structured, I think that will be useful. Then we'll look at Ashrei itself and we'll see how it's broken up and what the themes of Ashrei are. And then we'll move on. Probably what I do want to cover is just briefly, talk briefly about the following five Psalms and then to deal with a couple of the Psalms that we say on Shabbat and Yom Tov, beginning with Psalm 19, Hashemayim Misaprim Kvodel, glorious psalm. And then we'll finish up with Nishmat Yishtabach. And after that, uh, when we resume, probably after that, you know, in the next time we resume, to start with Shema and its blessings and then the Amida. Again, if anybody has any comments or questions, my email is dsilberatrisha.org. And uh, thank you for joining. And Shmuel, I haven't seen you in a while. Thank you for rejoining the class. I was getting worried about you. Um, okay. Thank you all for joining and uh, look forward to seeing you again, studying with you again. Thank I you. know that Rabbi Silber told us not to thank him for doing his job, but uh, he's also said many, many times over the course of running Drisha that Drisha is a place for intelligent pushback. So I will push back because he did say that we have a hope in prayer that we will learn to speak in such a fashion all the time and prayer is full of gratitude so of course thank you rabbi silver for a wonderful class and thank all of you for being part of drisha's learning community your contributions are truly truly appreciated uh, because heschel was mentioned i do want to point out that later in this current Zman that we're in, we will be having a class on Heschel and his thoughts related to Shemitah and the Holy Land given by Dr. Jorabandi. So if you'd like to check that out and sign up, feel free to look at our website. And of course, we will be back here same time, same place next week for the continuation of this class. Rabbi Silber also has a Sunday morning class, which I know many of you are a part of, but others are free to join. And Rabbi Leah Sarna began a 
Monday night talent year last night and wonderful. I have been enjoying it a lot so far. Uh, she's very dynamic and it's uh, a lot more energetic than you might expect for Monday night. So if, uh, if you don't have anything else going on, consider it. And I hope that you are well and good night. Thank you. Thank you.